Welcome to Forbidden Door. Now, this is the third time because I messed up twice. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, I'm probably not going to stick any images in this video. It is going to be no vi no images because it will take me a long time to edit this. And if I do put images in it, it will be only maybe a few. Let me say this. Was And I'm saying this now. And then I'm going to explain my thoughts after the comment I'm about to say. Do, you, do I believe, I'm about to say you, do I believe that this was a good show? Yes. Will people enjoy it? Yes. Will there be many people who are going to hate it because they don't like the AEW style or the New Japan Pro Wrestling style? Yes. But here's what the big question is that I'm going to try and answer and then I'll give my thoughts why after I give my review of this entire show. Will this help New Japan Pro Wrestling in the AEW? On the surface, I don't think so. It's very hard to say. But, and there's an asterisk on this, it depends on one thing. Cooperation. Across storylines. Now, I'll explain my thoughts on that at the end of this. Hopefully, I don't forget. Because there's so much here. There was a five-hour show, guys. This is a long-ass show. From seven, literally, when the show started... And buy-in is when they started showing wrestling matches. A lot of them. I think there's what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I think 13 to 14 matches. Rivaling the WWE in WrestleMania. There's a lot of matches. Now, buy-in match. We had... The factory of Solo and QT Marshall versus Yoshi, Hashu, Hashu ha, Hatisha, ha, Hatishi, Hatishi, I believe, and Goto. And I'm mispronouncing the last name of Yoshi, so I'm sorry. I'm at least pronouncing Yoshi correctly. Was it a good match? It was all right. It was a good opener, and New Japan won this. I will say on and off, when they had to have New Japan versus AEW, it was mostly kind of 50-50. Most people would not like that, but in this situation, I believe it was the wisest thing to do because I'm sure both companies did not want to look bad to their, their own fan base. So there was no way they're going to make they're gonna mess each other up. They had to make sure the stars and the groups that were doing the work would at least look good. Now, the match that did not need to be on the buy-in at all was only due to the fact of the G1 for New Japan Pro Wrestling because Lance Archer is going to be in it and Camarado from the factory is going to be in it. That's the only reason they both had the match and the only reason Archer won. And this is sad due to the fact they do nothing with Archer on AEW, who's muscle that never gets anywhere. Camarado, the same thing. He's muscle and they never get him anywhere. This is where I always question AEW. I'm not saying you got to make every big guy look more dominant over the smaller guys. But when you really make this, the big guys look like crap when it's in a clinch, if you put them in a special position and a special storyline, what is the point? I'm just saying. You get my point. Now, we had Keith Lee and Strickland versus... Um, Kami, what is the name? Kami Mia, Kami Maku, Kami Aku. Um, no, Kami Mash, Mayu, and El, Dur what is it? El, I am tired. <laughs> Not El Dorado, but, um, El uh, Dastido, I believe. Now, here's the thing. I don't care about Strickland, not because I think he's crap. It's just that he doesn't sell that well. He just doesn't. Then I care about Keith Lee, who sells very well. He's a very strong power wrestler, and he has a certain charisma. The problem here is you stuck them both together. You stuck a guy who does not sell well. He's very charismatic. He's very acrobatic and very, very flexible. But he doesn't sell well with a guy who is very strong, who does sell well, but is not as charismatic as the other guy. And it just, there's something wrong there. It doesn't work for me personally. It just doesn't. In the end, was it a bad match? No. The, um, 
Des uh, Desper uh, Desperado, I believe El Desperado and Coming Mio, Coming Mio, Mio won the match, and then we get Hobbs and Starks pretty much telling them who the hell you think you are. You're nobody, and they compared them to the basketball. I've literally have forgotten basketball, guys. I haven't cared about basketball since the 90s, so I'm not even going to talk anything about who they mentioned, even though I do know them, and right now I'm tired, so I'm going to forget the names and botch them. But you do know if you did see the show. But here's the thing. They need titles. I want to see Hobbs and Starks have the titles, so if they're going to have to do something with Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland, it makes sense. Here, there's nothing there. Unless the... FTW titles up for grabs by Keith Lee or Strickland, why care? They need either a stipulation or they need a title to fight over. I'm just saying. Finally, the Gun Club and Caster versus LA Dojo. Now, they're supposed to be for New Japan Strong, I believe. So, all those guys there, mostly American wrestlers and I think American and Japanese wrestlers were up against them. And guys, you may not like Billy Gunn, but that bastard is seven years older than me. That bastard looks like he could still go for another 10 years. He's 58 years old. And the way he looks... And the condition he has, either he's going to be able to go for another five years or another eight years. And the condition he is in, he's in such good condition. He is, what they say, a freaking freak. Now, I'm not saying I look great for my age. I don't. I know I look great. I know my hair looks great. I know I'm balding. I lost a lot of hair due to stress. But that guy is a freaking freak. He looks great for his age. And when you see him in a ring, he looks so good. I actually would like to see him go on a run on his own without his sons there, who are in the mid, no, late 20s, early 30s. I just want to see him on his own and actually do a run. Yes, who wants to see an old guy take a spot from a new guy? Normally, no. But I do believe the way Billy works, and Sting for that man, I'll get him to minute in a few minutes, they could actually do something. I'm just saying. Now, opening. This is the main card. Six-man tag or trios title. Not trios title, but two trios match. The Jericho Appreciation Society with Miroru Suzuki. Finally got his name right. With Eddie Kingston, Yuda, and Omeno. Or Unmeno. Who supposedly is the son of of a guy that Chris actually used to go up against when he used to work in Japan and actually whooped his ass a lot. So this had kind of a story that I kind of wish they had a couple of weeks to build up into a month. Wouldn't it have been nice to have just a match between Chris and Manuno by himself because of what he did with his father? I kind of wish that over this match. Now, was it a bad match? No. See, says Miru Suzuki go up against Eddie Kingston and Eddie's trying to chop the crap out of him and it doesn't work and he takes a straight elbow to the face and he got his ass whooped. Most people say, I don't like that. Other people would love it. For me personally, this helps Eddie. Eddie Kingston is so over at this point. See him get his ass whooped by Miru Suzuki who is a legend in Japan. It's not going to hurt him. In fact, I think it'll enhance what he's got. When it comes down to it, the Jericho Appreciation Society wins. And what was going on along with it? There was, well, the key of this entire match was that whoever won it is supposed to have an edge and blunt gust this, this Wednesday. The key of this, it would be better if it had been on a pay-per-view by itself, not being thrown on a dynamite. For me personally, I do believe it should have been on a pay-per-view. But... It is going to be on a dynamite. Hopefully it will work out. But now we get this edge for the Jericho Appreciation Society. Now, moving on. The triple threat. 
for not only the ROH Tag Titles, but the IWGP World Heavyweight Titles. Are, they, are there any IWGP Junior Heavyweight Titles? You guys tell me below. I don't know. So, I think there's only the Heavyweight Titles, but if there's a Junior, I wouldn't be too surprised. So, we got the ROH Champions FTR. We had... Um, I believe it's Punky Vice. Finally, I think I remember it when it comes to Rocky as well as to Trent. And then we have the members from the United Empire, which was Hobbs and Khan. Great old Khan. And I believe, what's his name? Um, what was this guy's name? I can't remember the guy's Cobb's name. Um, Jake Cobbs, I think. I don't remember. Was it a good match? Yes. At one point, Dash... Dax got his arm popped or something, got hurt. And he actually was taken to the back to get um, um, taped up. Literally, the, um, what do they call it? The sports tape? He got all taped up so he can go back out there and finish the match. Which he did. And the new IWGP World Heavyweight Champions are FTR. This is unprecedented. The question's going to be, as I said earlier, what's going to happen? How the, the collaboration, that's going to be a question, how to make, make it work. And I'll have to explain that more during this review, a little bit more what I'm talking about. Now, the All-Atlantic title match, of uh, they had to pull somebody out. So a guy named, um, what is this guy's name? I'm trying to remember his name. Um, well, we got Malachi Black, we got Pac, we got Miro, and we got, what is it, um, um, Connor, I believe his name was, oh, it is Clark Connor, that is a weird name, why would you call yourself Clark? <laughs> anyway, was this a good showing for Clark Connor, who didn't have the same experience as everybody else, supposedly? Yeah, it was fine, it was a good match. But I didn't think Miro would win. I mean, let me let me put you like this. Did Malachi look good? He looked like he could have won. Was Miro looking good? He definitely was one I thought was going to win. But did I want them to win? No. I didn't want Connor to win. I didn't want Black to win. And I didn't want Miro to win. The only person I truly wanted to win was Pac. He was the only person I wanted to win because as far as I'm concerned, Pac should have been a champion more than a year and a half ago. But due to the fact of the pandemic, he couldn't come back into the country. So I think the TNT Championship would have probably gone on his waist first before anybody else. I truly believe Pac would have been the first TNT champion, but they couldn't do it. They weren't able to do it. I believe Cody versus Pac would have happened. But it never did, due to the fact that Pac could not come back into the country. So it happened the way it did. So what I truly wanted was Pac to win. And he won. Yay! I was so happy that he won. It's what I wanted. But then I had to think about it. As a fan, the guy I wanted to win did win. But as a reviewer, I had to think... Was this title really meant for anyone to try and go after it? Or was it just meant for anyone internationally? And since Pac won, and it wasn't, it wasn't um, Connor, it makes you think, well, guess what? It's exactly what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a European title, just like the WWE. That's what it is. Now, mind you, they could still have Americans win it, and I hope they do. I really hope they have an American win the All-Atlantic eventually. But I have to take it for what it is. They're letting Europeans fight for it. Hopefully they will have Americans go after it. But if they don't, the first person to get it who I do believe deserves a title for so long. And even the crowd who was very vocal throughout the entire show. Yeah, they had a few lulls. They were happy to see Pac finally have a championship. And so was I. You guys, I don't know how you feel, but for me personally, I'm glad Pac won. But then I know for a fact that this could be just for Europeans. 
because they just don't have any titles for any Europeans to work with, and they just stuck them with this. I'm just saying. Now, um, oh, something in my eye. Now, let's go to the match that I was surprised about. Bullet Club versus Darby Allen, Sting, and Gi Chi Chigata. Um, what is it? She caught Shikoda or she got Chikata. I could be pronouncing his name wrong, and I think I am. Shin um, Kada. I believe that's his last name. Let me tell you something. If you think Sting's too old to go, watch this match. Because even though Sting wasn't 100% perfect, he's not able to go as fast as he wants in the ring. Trust me. But the opening of him jumping off again off the top of something way higher than he should be at 65 nearing 66 years old. I think he's 64 into 65, I believe. That shows you he's still capable of handling it and not hurting himself too badly. The match for me personally was good. It wasn't the greatest match in the entire night. You will hear my favorite. But it was a good match. In the end, the face is one. I was not surprised. And Shikada, I mean, no, Shikada, gave a little fist bump to a sting out of respect. I enjoyed that. Now, one of the weaker matches, and unfortunately it's a weak match, and I don't like it, but the way they built this, I'm not surprised. Thunder Rosa versus Tony Storm. Now, guys, I love me Tony Storm, and I love me a Thunder Rosa. <coughs> but let's be honest. Was the build for these two good? No. And that's the problem. The women's builds have not been very good. Instead of focusing on one of the shows, either Rampage or Dynamite, to really make it mean something, they try to spread it across both of them, and then they throw in others along with it. They really need to focus the women on one show, either Dynamite, and make sure these women finally get the time they need, or Rampage, and finally get the time they need. Because as it stands, it, it's sp sporadic for me personally. And that pisses me off because I want to see these women get treated better. Now, was the match good? Of course it was. And I'm not saying the match was bad. I will easily say it was the third best match, even though it wasn't the most greatest match. But due to the fact the story was not that strong, the match quality was good. You got two good wrestlers. Tony Storm is a damn good wrestler, and so is Thunder Rosa. In the end, I was not surprised Thunder Rosa retained. There was no way she was going to just drop it to Tony Storm. The way they're booking the women right now, I don't expect it to happen. It was for what it was. Now, who is going to be next for Thunder Rosa? I don't know. I think the next part they're going to start working on is a TBS title picture when it comes to Jay Cargill and Athena. I don't know if it's going to be the next show they're going to put on or it's going to be on Rampage or Dynamite where they're going to focus directly on it. Probably they may do it on Rampage more than they will on Dynamite. But that's what I think they're going to focus on next because I don't think Thunder Rose will be focused on now. They're going to focus on Jade dealing with Athena. I'm just saying. Now, the I... Hmm... Let me give you to like this when it came to Will Ospreay versus a Orange Cassidy. Was it the best match you could have ever seen? It was a good match. Did it have character because of how both of them were acting? Yes. I don't think everyone's going to like the character that Osprey gives off. And you take or leave what you get from Orange Cassidy. I don't mind Orange. And when it came to Will Ospreay, it was an interesting attitude that he had. Especially when it came to open and well. When it came to Ozzy Open, I liked them. I don't know what it is about this group. I like Ozzy Open with Will Osprey. They have personality. I just wish we could see more of them on AEW TV or if I have the time, if they go on New Japan Pro Strong whenever I could ever see it. I never get the time to see the actual New Japan Pro Wrestling or Strong because I'm always doing videos. So it's so hard to watch it. But it was an interesting situation. Now, here's the thing. Did I actually think Orange was going to win? No. 
I don't think they were going to let Orange job here, particularly that they barely showed Osprey dealing with Orange until about two weeks ago or a week ago. I can't remember. So there was barely any time to really build it correctly because if they really wanted to make these things really mean something, they would have spread this more thoroughly across Rampage and Dynamite over a month and a half to two month period with Orange Cassidy, Chaos dealing with the um, United Kingdom. It just, it needed more. It just wasn't there enough. I'm just saying. Now, the match I'm waiting for. I don't know about you, but this match was the best match of the night because of the person that showed up and the, the, the way that it was structured. And that was Zack Sabre Jr. versus the replacement for Brian Danielson who was injured, probably got concussion because he kind of was hinting at it. Claudio Passanelli, if I'm pronouncing his name. A.K.A. Cesaro. My boy. Finally, he shows up on AEW TV. Finally, everybody was going ape shit for him. Claudio is here. That's probably going to be the title of this. And I'm probably not going to change it. Maybe I'll throw a picture. He may be the only picture I'm going to show in here. You know what? I think this might be the only picture I'm going to throw in here. No, no, no. I want to get this video up as soon as possible. Probably I will not. Ugh, I want to put pictures in here so bad. But anyway, was the match good? Damn good. This was the best match of the night for me personally. It wasn't the most technical match. It wasn't the most strong style match. It was a mixture of them all. And you did see a lot of technical wrestling. Now, is everyone going to like that? No. But I will say the character... Of Claudio really helped a lot with the cheering of the fans. The fans were going ape shit for him more than anyone else. Believe me. And there was a lot of people cheering for a lot of Japanese wrestlers. But this one truly got them going. And this was nearing the end of the night. They love Claudio. Because everyone knows how good he was. How the WWE treated him like shit. And he dealt with it for so many years until he finally said, you know what, I'm done. And now he's in AEW, which I don't know if he's going to get anywhere, but hopefully he will. It was a great showing for Claudio. And he's the one that's going to go into blood and guts. I'm not going to elaborate more on that, but you get my point. This was the best match for me personally. I did love it. The way they structured it, how um, Sabre Jr. basically focused on his left arm and his right leg, I believe. I did like how he was, no, his right arm, I believe, and his left leg. I believe that's how he was doing it. He made it a systematic dissection of Claudio to try and get him to lose when he wasn't going to lose. Let's move on to the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship. Jay White versus Kata versus Hangman Page versus a Adam Cole. I'll give it to you like this. Kata is interesting. I don't know what it is about him. I don't know. It's not his blonde hair that makes him interesting. There's something there about the Rainmaker. I don't know what it is yet. It's due to the fact I have not seen him that I don't know what it is. It could be a bad interesting or it could be a good interesting for me. I don't know. Like I said, it's very hard for me to be able to see New Japan Pro Wrestling or Strong for that matter, no matter if he's on that show or the other. I have almost no time. If I'm doing these videos and I'm trying to do animation on top of it, it makes it very hard to watch. Particularly that I'm sure if I did watch it, I'll probably want to do a review of it. And it makes it hard to do reviews of all these shows. I haven't even been able to go back to doing NWA reviews yet. And I, I missed at least one episode already because I was working on something. I, I've had no time. So it's so hard to get these shows done. But was it a good match? Yes, it was. I did enjoy the match, but did I believe Jay White was going to drop? No. But I did think if he was going to lose, if it was going to be somebody, it could have been either Adam Cole or Okada. I didn't think Adam Page was going to win. I did. But Jay White retained. And it kind of looked like Adam Cole might have gotten injured. I'm not sure if he's injured or not. He was able to leave under his own power that 
um, Excalibur did say that he was able to walk off the state, walk off the the mat, and walk up the the well the ramp on his own. So hopefully he's all right, but you never know. Finally, the last match of the night. Whew. The AEW interim title of John Moxley versus. Let me give it to you like this. When it comes to to Tomoishi. Tom, Tomaishi, I'm sorry. I'm really actually feeling very tired right now. Guys, I like him. He's interesting. I don't know if he's the ace like Brent Hart because I've not seen a lot of his work when he was younger and when he could do it. And understand this. If anybody says, hey, dude, he really is good. You can watch this. You can watch that. Understand, it's not the point that he used to be like that. I'm looking at him for what he is now. He's in his near 50s right now. I think he's nearly 40-something near 50. I think he's 47, I believe. I could be wrong. But he's nearing the end of his run as a wrestler. When you saw him in the ring with Moxley, you saw a guy who can't really run very well anymore. His knees are screwed up. His back might be even messed up. The way that he was working, even though he did a great job, you could tell he's been beaten down. So seeing him before, known as the ace, similar to a Brent Hart, will mean nothing. We're seeing him for what he is now. If he came into AEW, Impact Wrestling, NWA, we have to see him for what he is now, nearing the tail end of his career. So what I saw was an interesting wrestler. But I don't know if he's the ace anymore. Honestly, doesn't mean I am right. I just don't know. Was the match good? It was okay. It was not the best match in the night. That was Claudio versus um, Zack Sabre Jr. The second best match in the night was the All Atlantic match where Pack won. You could say this was a distant third. Honestly, for me personally, it could be different for you. The blood. I don't know if. Mox cut himself, or he got a nasty bump on the head, but he just started bleeding. It didn't help the match, honestly. I'm sure other people say the bleeding was great, but for me personally, it didn't really help the match due to the fact that I don't think Moxley should have won. I think Tomiyishi should have won. I think he should have, because I think the best person to go up against CM Punk would have been Tomiyishi. Versus a CM Punk. And this is where I'm going to start explaining what I thought about in the beginning of this review. Let me give it to you like this. When you look at AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling, both of them are trying to really make their mark in the United States. It's obvious. We are seeing more shows in the, in the United States. That's either New Japan Pro Strong or New Japan Pro Wrestling with commentators that can explain what's going on. Unfortunately, I never get a chance to see it. Like with New Japan Pro Wrestling, I never get a chance to see it due to the fact that when they're showing it, it's when pretty much is right after Impact Wrestling. By the time I finish doing my review, it's too late. I miss all of it. And if I try to see a replay, unfortunately, the replays don't always have English behind it. It takes days before it's shown. So I got other stuff to do. So, when it comes down to it, it's obvious that they are making a much more better presence in the United States. But here's the thing. Are we really going to gain something great between New Japan, Re New Japan Pro Wrestling and AEW? If they really want to make a mark, they must start combining the storylines and their talent. That is the only way they're going to get anywhere. This is what a lot of people don't understand when it came to the NWA. When NWA... I'm a little tired, guys. Sorry. Back in 1949, there were dozens upon dozens of wrestling promotions. There's no way there weren't. The most earliest promotion started around the 19, late 1920s. It was 1949 when the NWA had its first title and its first junior heavyweight title. There was no women's title until the 1950s. But pretty much their first titles came out right in the beginning of the 1950s, around the time of the Korean War. 
If you never heard what the, Kore the Korean War was, look it up. But the point is, when it came out, it became the first organizational promotion, not just a promotion, an organizational one. It's the first one. It's the one that managed to have one title that the other promotions were willing to recognize and their champion would run around to all these promotions to help put over their talent. That's where Ric Flair comes in. Now, of course, that's in the 70s, but the point is that Buddy Rogers did it. Hobbs did it. Nick, um, well, Bullwink, no, Nick Bockwinkle. He also, I believe, was the NWA champion. Harley Race was one. Superstar Billy Graham, I believe, was one. A lot of people were champions of the NWA and also did that round of going to all the other promotions and making and trying to drum up some publicity, make some cash, and make sure that those promotions work out. This is where we're at right now. AEW is not an organizational promotion. Neither is New Japan Pro Wrestling. You got two promotions that are working together in this one pay-per-view. But to be honest, they need an organizational promotion right now. They do. They need a promotion that they can have a title that can wander between the two. And they can try and do storylines between the two promotions. And it's not just one wrestler they do the storylines with. The best option was that both companies start doing joint promotions maybe three times a year or two times a year where they try and make sure that both promotions make storylines that both sides cross over like they did here with, with Forbidden, um, Forbidden Door. That's what they really need. That's what must be done. If both these companies really want to make a mark and really want to try and really make a mark in the United States, that's what they really need. But the problem is, I don't know if they're going to go there. And I don't know if both owners are willing to put their own egos or attitudes aside. Because look, no matter how Tony Khan is and the current owner of New Japan Pro Wrestling, then let's be honest, they may not be to the, the heights of a Vince and Kenny McMahon and being as stupid as he is for what he did, paying off a paralegal possibly with money from the company or his own funds. But the point is, we got two promoters that have their own attitudes, their own quirks, and their own, you know, they can both be pricks. Or they can both be great people. Or they don't have to be both prick, great people. They can do whatever the hell they want. But the key is, will they put their attitudes aside to try and find a way to have both these promotions and maybe another one to actually be able to make something? An organizational, promotional thing. One of those three. Or if someone... Let's say it was MLW. I'm not even saying MLW is the best one to say it. Because even though I've seen episode 50 of Fusion, does not mean they are the ones that would be great to be the head of the promotional government like NWA. And I can't say NWA either because it's too weak to be an organization promotion anymore. It just can't. It would just be regular promotion. But if there's one company that could become one, they could wander the title in between and also other titles that would really be good. That can really help storylines between other promotions. That's what they really need. Interaction. This is what I've been... Let me give it to you in this respect. What I've been telling you guys for more than a year. About stuff like this. Having good audio. Catering to the people at home. Not just the fans at home. It's different now. It is to cater to the people who are watching you on stream and paying for you on stream. Things are different. I see that if, the, if pro wrestling really wants to survive, this is just my point of view, I could be wrong. You need to have more interaction with promotions to the point where storylines that are going on between any promotions must heavily cross over. Now, we've had that like a little bit of Impact Wrestling with AEW and Impact Wrestling with NWA a little bit. A little bit. But I think it's time to take it more, a really more personal. You need more interaction with these promotions to the point where, yes, they still have their own pay-per-views, 
but having joint pay-per-views where each promotion gets to be ahead of the others and they rotate around would be the best thing because it'll expose all the promotions that are under that umbrella and make people want to watch them because as it stands that many people don't understand wrestling isn't increasing in size the fan base is not growing we still have the same old fans who are either my bracket or a little bit older or a little bit younger we're not increasing our numbers look you could say a lot about WWE but almost 10 years ago Right around this time, guess how much they had in ratings? A 4 to a 5. And everyone thinks that is bad because that means about 3, 4, 5, or 6 million people used to watch pro wrestling almost 10 years ago. And, well, between 4 to 5 million people used to watch 10 years ago. And when it dipped under that, they couldn't believe it. The Slug Daddy said, it's going to get bad. This is bad because WWE used to have more than that. They used to have almost 6 million people watching. It used to be the most popular thing in the 90s. We haven't had something like that in a long time. And no one seems to have the right formula to make it work. But you never know. Maybe they need to do more crossovers with these promotions to the point where they do more joint promotions to the point where they rotate through their pr these joint pay-per-views and they keep promoting the others. And crossing over doing stories. Because maybe that's what we need. We need a new perspective to bring more people in. So wrestling will not become scarcity. Right now. I'm not saying the WWE is doing it right. They're not. But are the fans that are in the WWE 100% coming to AEW, MLW, or, or Impact Wrestling in huge droves? No. Because when you look at any ratings or any type of report, many of them are not showing incredible growth. Now, it doesn't mean they're not putting on great shows or questionable shows that need work. It's just that we're not bringing in more people. There must be something going on here. And as far as I'm concerned, they need to change up. So, will AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling work out if they work together? I don't know. This might be the only time they'll work together, kind of like what happened with Impact Wrestling and AEW. Or they'll do more crossovers and do another pay-per-view in the next couple of months where AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling switch sides and you'll see more in, in AEW losing to New Japan Pro Wrestling and makes it feel more balanced. But this is just me, and I hope you enjoy this Forbidden Door AEW and Impact Wrestling, please give me a comment below. I may not put any images in here because I had to split the video because this thing only does 30 minutes at a time. And uh, I hope you enjoy this. Peace.